In this video, I'm going to take a look at what is now my new favourite um, A-level media text, and that's Have You Heard George's Podcast? Uh, there's going to be a particular focus on theory, um, some industry theories relating to the BBC, but also some audience theories too. Um, some of the BBC stuff, if you've listened to my Peaky Blinders um, video, will be um, kind of repetition, but we'll apply it then directly to this text too. So we'll start with a couple of theories, and this is Cohen and Seaton and David Hesmanhalge. And this is about the BBC. It's important, as you will have understood from my Peaky Blinders video, that the BBC maintains its ideological independence. It's funded by the public. It therefore must represent the public. And to represent the public, it must be independent. It does have commercial pressures um, whilst it is free from um, the ideological influence of, of commercial partners. It does still need to make money. It still needs to be um, successful, but it is free to be driven by ideology and social purpose rather than profit and power. In fact, it has a duty to be driven by ideology and social purpose because it is reflecting the diverse social communities of the UK. So it supports Curran and Seaton's idea that more socially diverse patterns of ownership help to create the conditions for more varied and adventurous media productions. This is without question a varied and adventurous media production. And that brings us on to David Hesmanhalge. He says that the idea that cultural industry companies try to minimise risk and maximise audiences through vertical and horizontal integration and by formatting their cultural products. I would argue strongly that this text challenges Hesman Halge's theory because this is an inherently risky product. It is a radical product which is challenging mainstream views which is challenging the established views of the BBC's established audience. And in doing that, it becomes very, very risky, but it's also absolutely necessary for the BBC to produce a show, a podcast such as, have you heard George's podcast? Because they have to reflect the communities who fund them. And therefore they have to challenge in many ways mainstream culture. They have to produce content which challenges mainstream ideology. And this is certainly one of those. But that makes it risky. It's appealing probably originally to a fairly niche audience. But George has very cleverly um, formatted his podcast so that it appeals to a much broader audience than that. But let's not pretend this isn't a risky product. It is. Um, and the BBC was taking a risk in producing it. But their core mission is to serve all audiences through the provision of impartial, high quality and distinctive output. And that's why this podcast is so important. It is does provide us with some impartiality in that it's reflective of different views and cultures and communities. It is high quality and is certainly distinctive because it goes against mainstream ideology. And in terms of the five public purposes, really, it's number four that we're going to focus on with regards to this podcast to reflect, represent and serve the diverse communities of all of the UK's nations and regions. That's going to be really important for this text. But the reason I think that George's podcast is not just now my favourite text, but also probably the most important text that we study um, at A level is because this of this idea of media gatekeepers. This is the idea. Gatekeepers are the people who control who's coming into the media industry and controlling the products that go out of the media industry. And in doing so, those gatekeepers can control to a large extent. They certainly did historically, less so now because audiences have much more choice. But historically, the gatekeepers have controlled the media that we consume. They therefore control the ideology that that media reflects. 
and the way that we are influenced by that ideology. And the important point here is that historically, and still to a certain extent today, media gatekeepers have been straight white men. And the reason that's important is because if you've got straight white men controlling media output, what you get are narratives which maintain the power structures that suit straight white men. So we get media products that reflect the idea of white supremacy. We get media products that reinforce patriarchal order. And if we don't change the media gatekeepers, we will never change the narratives, or to a certain extent, we won't change the narratives and the ideologies that the media industry is promoting and reinforcing. This is hugely important. And for that reason, we're going to consider briefly George Gerbner's theory. This idea that the exposure to re repeated patterns of representation over long periods of time can shape and influence the way in which people perceive the world around them. That's the idea that the media can cultivate our own beliefs and ideologies. If we have largely white, straight, male representation in the media, that narrative is maintained and that ideology is reinforced and accepted. It is the media's responsibility and certainly the BBC's responsibility as an organisation which has to reflect the communities of the UK to cultivate an ideology that is representative of the diversity of Britain. And, that, and there I'm including disability, sexuality, certainly race and certainly gender. It must be diverse. And for that reason, the BBC has gone on a mission over the last few years to diversify itself. Because if it doesn't diversify itself from within, the gatekeepers will remain straight white men and the narratives and the ideology it promotes will therefore remain as it always has been. You must diversify the workforce within in order to diversify the output that is coming out of the BBC. And they therefore set up this target, which was 50-2012. So the BBC, over the, it was set out in 2020 and over the next five years, it said, that its staff, its staff and its presenters and the people working at the BBC would be 50% women, 20% black, Asian or minority ethnic, and at least 12% would be disabled. Now, we could, we could spend hours picking apart why that aim is problematic. I mean, what is being represented here, what is not being represented here, I think is in, really important for you to consider. But at least it shows that the BBC are moving towards changing the gatekeepers within its, its industry, within the industry. And in changing the gatekeepers, we can change the narrative and the output that is coming out of that industry, too. And that's hugely important for reshaping narrative and ideology. And that's why this text is so important, because what the podcast is setting out to do is to change that narrative. And in episode one, the very first episode of his podcast, these are some of the things that George says. I've taken these from the transcripts. He says, everything you know is a story, an idea that you've accepted until the day you cross it out and replace it with a better answer. Here he's talking about discourses, he's talking about narratives, he's talking about the stories that the media have told us over time. And with those gatekeepers being white men, the narratives we've been told suit that those white men and maintain the power structures that suit them. And therefore, George is saying we need to change that story. Secondly, he says here, in fact, we all do. So why is it that we as a community have no control over our narrative? Our main storytellers are rappers. George is exposing the fact here that the media industry and its gatekeepers do not allow communities such as his, the black communities of the UK, 
to control their own narrative. They have historically not had agency in constructing their own identity. It has been constructed for them by somebody who doesn't understand their narrative. And that's the point he makes in the third paragraph. Personally, I have no opinion on Pluto. He was talking about his education here. But when it comes to this beautiful, resilient, overlooked, traumatized community, I've got skin in the game. I've got 27 years of experience. So no matter what stories come up in the papers about our trigger happy gangland or our state dependent single mums, I remember everything firsthand. He's exposing the fact that this podcast is going to present to us a genuine, authentic, first hand experience of an underrepresented and a misrepresented community. That's his community. That's his black community within the UK. And he now has agency. The BBC have given him agency as a black man to tell his story and the story of that community in an authentic way. It's why this text is so crucial. And he finishes by saying we should revisit our story and instead of retelling it, we should rewrite it. I'm not saying let's fabricate history. I'm saying let's learn to interpret what we're going through in a way that makes us stronger. Just by having this platform and this podcast, George is not only empowering himself, but he's providing an empowered voice for an entire community of underrepresented people. He does similarly in episode three about the Grenfell tragedy, and it's entirely appropriate for the BBC and for George to feature this tragedy on his podcast because it is a tragedy of social and racial inequality and it exposes that racial and social inequality within the UK. The episode therefore provides a voice for underrepresented or misrepresented groups and it exposes intersectional prejudice and inequality. And therefore, it fulfills the BBC's objective of representing the diverse communities of the UK. In one of the opening sequences, um, the teacher talks about, she says here, she's, she's talking to Savannah, who's dismissing her maths class. She says, OK, she's teaching her about um, probability. She says, so less than write this down, less than three percent, less than three percent of new businesses do those kinds of numbers. And many of them rely on private funders. Now, I can tell you because you guys are, are grown companies owned by Africans like you, Savannah, are four times more likely than ones owned by white people to, to be denied a loan. And then she follows that up. She says the three biggest challenges to Africans and women who have businesses are access to finances. This is about intersectional prejudice and intersectional inequality. This is what Bell Hooks talks about. Um, and so George is using the platform and the BBC is using this podcast to represent social groups and to expose inequalities within the communities that it is seeking to represent. It's hugely important stuff. But then episode three becomes even more important and even more powerful because that teacher then goes into the deputy head's office within the school that she works in. And that deputy head is constructed as being a white man. We know that because of the language that um, he uses and because of some of the things that he says. Our, our perception should be that this is a white man. And that white man appears as a bit of an idiot, actually, a bit of a bumbling fool. He says things like, as you can see at the top there, you know, ultimately our differences are only skin deep. He talks about how our um, responsibility as educators is to um, ensure that we send our pupils out as functioning human beings. He tells the teacher that she would be better to work in a pupil referral unit. We are positioned as an audience to reject this man, to view him as a bit of an idiot, to question his views. And what is so powerful about this is here we have, uh, it actually, it is George providing the voice Although we are positioned to see the character as a white man, 
it is a black man controlling his voice. This is entirely subverting the idea of the media gatekeeper, because previously it has been the white man who has controlled the black voice within media output. And therefore, it has been the white man who has controlled the black narrative in terms of media output. Here we have a black man with agency controlling the narrative of the white man. It's a hugely important moment. It's, an it's a hugely important text in changing and shifting the media landscape so that more diverse identities have agency and control, not only over their own narratives, but also over the narratives of groups who have previously had the power in this industry. It's a major shift and it's a crucially important moment. Now we're going to move on to audiences and the ways in which this podcast, this text is empowering its audiences. We've looked at that in terms of representation. We're now going to look at it in terms of participation. And that's what Henry Jenkins talks about. He says the idea that fans are active participants in the construction and circulation of textual meanings. They contextually poach um, meanings from texts and use them to construct their own identity. Um, so this is about how the media now has power. The media isn't just a passive the audience isn't just a passive recipient of media messages. It can now take media products and use them to empower themselves. And social media is the perfect example of that because social media allows audiences to share texts, to share messages and to speak back to those texts. And every time, as you can see in lots of these examples here, every time somebody comments on George's podcast, every time they reply to him on Twitter, what they are doing is reinforcing, constructing and reinforcing their own identities. So the internet, as um, Jenkins would argue, has empowered audiences to no longer be victims of media ideology, but instead to change that ideology, to use it to reshape their own identities. And that's what George does through his um, social media content. He is always sharing the comments of his audiences so that they get a voice too. And that brings us on to Clay Shirky, because George does recognise that the podcast as a medium does have limitations because the nature of the podcast means that he is talking to audiences. So in a way, he is preaching to audiences in the same way that he has been preached to by the white voice for his entire life. And he doesn't want to be, I don't think, another media producer who preaches to his audience. He recognises that in order for this podcast to be successful, in order for it to achieve its aim of giving a voice to these misrepresented or underrepresented communities, he has to allow that audience and that community to speak back. He has to give them a real voice. And this is kind of what Clay Shirky talks about. He says that the internet, like Jenkins, the internet has reshaped the, re the relationship between audiences and producers. We are no longer passive recipients. We can talk back to those texts, we can talk back to the media, and we can also produce our own content, and we can contribute to the content that is being shown to us. So we now have agency within this media industry. That's what Clay Shirky talks about. Now social media is a part of that because of course every time somebody comments on the show they are in some way influencing the content of that show. But that still has limitations and George recognises this and that's why he has created on the back of the podcast the new platform which is Common Ground. And as you can see from his tweets here he talks a lot about, he says, my team and I have created this platform to capture your reactions to chapter three of my podcast. On Common Ground, I want to encourage a, a meaningful exchange of ideas. 
So each time you listen to an episode, head over and let's chat. He's asking for his audience to contribute. He wants to hear what they have to say. And in the video that you can listen to when you go onto the Common Ground website, these are some of the things that he says. He says this platform was created to have a two way conversation with you, my audience. That's it. Clay Shirky in action, a two way conversation between producer and audience. I want to understand how the thoughts that he's expressing in the podcast affect you. And then he's telling us that actually his audience are going to help him create content. Some of your answers will be available with your consent to other users on the platform. And then we will present our findings back to you in the most creative way possible. So he's telling us that as audiences, we have the power to influence his content, to contribute to his content and to talk back to him. And he finishes by saying, thank you for joining us on this journey. Now, this is a journey of social change. This is a journey of changing stereotypes. This is a journey of shifting misrepresentations. And he's telling you as an audience that we can be part of it. We no longer just have to listen. We can actually be part of the reshaping of the media landscape and be part, part of the reshaping of these representations. It's a very, very powerful platform. Um, and George is showing us that he understands the modern media landscape. So for every episode, you can go on to Common Ground and you can click on an episode and there are a series of questions that George asks his audience and, and you can respond to those individually. So you can contribute to future content as well as commenting on the content that he's already put out. And then quite literally, you can add a, a sound file to the platform. So quite literally, you can speak back to this media text. This is a very, very rare thing, particularly for um, a medium such as the podcast. The podcast is designed to be listened to. And George doesn't want his audience to be just listeners. He wants to empower them even more than that. And here you can literally talk back to him. You can record something and you can send it to him. And for all we know, he might, he might feature those sound bites in future episodes, or certainly it might become content on the Common Ground website. George is someone who doesn't just want to represent his audiences, but he wants to give them agency and empower them too.